Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Today, I am talking with Brittany. She discusses going through the loss of her twin daughters at 16 weeks through a termination for medical reasons due to them being conjoined. Brittany also talks about the extensive testing done before having to make the heartbreaking decision and how her health was also at risk. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Brittany. Brittany, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Brittany, and I am originally from Glendale, Arizona, but I currently reside in Los Angeles, California, And I've lived here almost eight years now. And um, I'm happily married almost two years next month. And I'm a motion graphics designer. And I love to travel and I love the arts and just happily living my life here. (laughs) So do you mind talking a little bit about your last story? Yes, I would love to share that with everybody today. So my husband and I, we had just started trying to start a family earlier this year. And, and really surprisingly, we, we were able to get pregnant very quickly, which was very exciting for, for me. And I found out in late March, right before Easter, everything seemed to be going very well. Just very classic pregnancy symptoms. I was doing pretty well. I was able to still manage work and I did start feeling all the normal symptoms of, you know, morning sickness and and tiredness and all of that. But I really loved being pregnant. And and then for probably the that first three months of pregnancy, everything went really normal. I had all my I had my first um, OBGYN appointment, got to see my little baby, what I thought was my one single baby (laughs) at about nine weeks. And, And then the second appointment came up where I did all my genetic testing and an ultrasound. And that's when we saw something very, very surprising and also very concerning we noticed that there were two babies. I was having twins and I was initially very shocked at that, but very overjoyed too. Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm going to have twins. (laughs) Although I did have a slight feeling I might have twins because I started feeling, I started feeling movement really early and I had, I had looked that up and that could have been an indication of twins. So I just kind of put it in the back of my head and didn't really think much too much on it because the first ultrasound only showed one, one baby. And so, and so this appointment, you know, we saw two babies and then my husband noticed something really concerning on the ultrasound that they looked really close together. And the doctor also noticed that she said, yeah, they look very close and they were facing each other. And so she right away, she referred us to a fetal medicine specialist and she called him instantly and gave us some papers. And we then tried to call him to schedule an appointment, which we were able to get the very next day. And I was so anxious about that and just going through all of these all of these anxious thoughts of, oh no, this changes everything. I I was thinking, you know, could anything be done to, to help the situation? And I was praying that this wasn't, you know, what we, what I had feared the most was that, you know, they would be conjoined. So we went to the, the appointment and went through an initial ultrasound with the, the sonographer And then the specialist came in, went through another ultrasound, and he was able to confirm 
to us that my babies were conjoined and they were they shared one heart and one liver and some other organs like intestines and so that was that was the extent of what we could all see so far during that ultrasound appointment and we were there for half the day the specialist kept us there because he really wanted us to speak to another specialist at Cedar sinai and he's an infant cardiologist so so we waited there in in a waiting room and i was just in tears i was i could not control my 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 sobbing i was just sobbing incontrollably and i i was i was just so so much in grief already so much in sorrow that it felt like nothing could be done so a diagnosis like this this is this is what i had feared initially from that the day prior, I was like, as long as they don't share a heart, there could be a chance that, you know, they could, they could maybe be separated and, or some, something that they could, they could be given a much better prognosis. I kind of already knew that in my mind somehow, but then hearing that news that they shared a heart, that just, my whole world broke. And I thought, wow, like I have been this first three months of pregnancy, just so hopeful, so excited, so looking forward to starting my family. We'd even moved from our old one bedroom apartment to a two bedroom. And, and I was just, I was, I was so excited to, to start a family. And then this, my whole world shattered from this news. So we waited, I had to go, my husband and I had to go downstairs for lunch just to grab something to eat and I was still crying uncontrollably my husband called my insurance company to to see if we could even get this kind of specialist appointment somehow covered or if that it was covered under my insurance and I I couldn't even talk over the phone with my the people from my insurance company because I I was just inconsolable and so we we went back up after after that conversation and lunch and waited a little more and then by the end of the day the doctor got the infant cardiologist on the phone or yeah it was through FaceTime and we did another ultrasound so i think i did a total of 3 or 4 ultrasounds that day and they were conversing over the phone over FaceTime and they were kind of doing they're, they were kind of geeking out over something that looks so unique, their heart. And for me, I was just, I was, I, I, I couldn't even speak. I, I just didn't even know what to think. And it was hard to hear, you know, the contrast of their conversations with everything I was experiencing, the heartbreak, the absolute devastation I was going through, but they, they, the infant car- cardiologist got even more insight into looking at the heart because they, they really narrowed in on the heart and how unique the heart was. It wasn't like a normal human heart. There were certain things, valves and chambers that were different in order to keep both of my twin baby girls surviving in order to pump blood to both of their bodies but there were there were there were a few significant things in their bodies that weren't working well there were what seemed to be kind of like cysts in their in one of the baby's necks and and there were there were just certain things that weren't functioning well so the so the specialist the, the fetal medicine specialist eventually had to really wanted us to schedule an appointment with that with the same infant cardiologist. So we were able to do that with a little bit of obstacles. We were able to do that for the next week. And so we went over that following week to with the infant cardiologist, got another ultrasound from the sonographer. Then the cardiologist met with us afterwards, got another ultrasound. So I've been through so many multiple ultrasounds and, and through that meeting with this 
cardiologist, he was able to give us so much insight. And I was just feverishly writing down all the notes I could manage, you know, everything he said. But he gave us so much more insight into how the heart looked and into how the liver even was. The liver, normally for one single person, a liver has hepatic a hepatic vein to to really support that person's life, their body. But these these two little babies had one liver and one hepatic nerve, and they needed two. And so there were just all a list a list of all these things that were not right. And he he went extensively into detail about about their heart and how it was functioning and how it only had, you know, two, I think it was two to three chambers and it just wasn't enough to really support both of them outside of my womb. And he also talked about what separation surgery would look like, which with one heart couldn't be done without one, one of the babies having to lose their life and trying to for the surviving baby to to sustain that baby and have the heart you know surgically placed back into their body essentially and it wouldn't just be like heart surgery it would be involve so many other organs like the liver and the intestines and whatever other organs and other you know other parts were compromised that it would be about, it would take probably half of a day for all of these different surgeons and specialists to be coming in. And it would just be so, so physically taxing on the baby. And even to get to that point, if, if we were even to, to get to that point, the babies may have had not even survived delivery. They very well could have been stillbirths. And so there were just so many variables, so many unknowns throughout this whole, this whole process. The fetal medicine specialist, the, to go back, he did tell me the risk it would be for my life for delivery. So I would have had to have had a C-section if I were to have gone through full term. And the, the C-section would not have been a classic incision. It would have been both horizontal and vertical incision of my abdomen because they're conjoined. And so they're, they would be so large at that point if I had come to full term and it would have definitely put me at risk of a hysterectomy. It, I, I, and death, even I could have bled out on the table, had risk of uh, having having like a blood infection or having a heart attack. And there's just on top of the increased risk of uh, preeclampsia and hypertension. And it's, it was just the, the laundry list of all these things were, were just so long. It's just news, these bad news after bad news. And so not only were my, my babies so much at risk and there was so much unknown with them, there was also this risk of, for me, wanting to, wanting to still bring them into this world. There was a risk over my life if I, if I were to get to that point. And so, so after meeting with the cardiologist, my husband and I, we had to really, really talk about, you know, where, where we, with the direction we wanted, we needed to go. And you know, at first we we still wanted to see if we could try to to deliver our babies, but that that really did those both those appointments really really shifted you know our thoughts and and so the the fetal medicine specialist referred us to one more specialist and she was with UCLA so and she used to be a resident with him. And, and so we met with her and by this time I was already about 15 weeks into my pregnancy. And then we went through two more ultrasounds again, the specialist came in and, 
And she was able to confirm even more just with the baby's growth. She was able to get a better look inside through the ultrasound. And she she saw some more developments in their bodies that weren't functioning correctly. She saw that in both of their brains that something didn't form that didn't didn't correctly form that determines, you know, their motor skills, their fine motor skills. And then within their heart, the blood from the left part of the heart was mixing with the blood from the right part of the heart, which isn't good. Those, those aren't supposed to mix. The one, one side of the heart, there's oxygen in it, and it's not supposed to mix with the other part. So, so that, that oxygenated blood is not supposed to mix with the non-oxygenated blood. So that wasn't functioning well. And then she, she was able to see the bowels that were conjoined as well. So just able to confirm, yes, that from, I think she said, from the sternum to the bladder, all the way to the bladder, they were conjoined. So their whole abdomen was conjoined. And we had just thought previously, okay, I think maybe only around to the mid, mid, stomach midways that that they were conjoined but it, it went all the way to their bladder and their kidneys were were not functioning one of the twins I think twin B which which on the ultrasound was on the left she wasn't doing her kidneys weren't functioning well and she could tell through the coloring on the image and so there there were just even more heartbreaking news for my babies and and she just had to just tell us by the end of, of that, that I'm so sorry, your babies are not compatible with life. And she said, normally when, when we give these kind of news of, of, you know, when there's some kind of abnormality, fetal abnormality, there, it's kind of a gray area where you can, we, we've said before, like, well, there's these issues, but they can still live. There's still a chance for them to live a live a life, even though it will be a more challenging life and and um, definitely need you know a lot more attention. She said this this I can say a lot more conclusively that that their lives are incompatible. They're 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 incompatible with life. And and again, my my heart just sank because. We, my husband and I had been doing a lot of praying and, you know, seeking God. And, and in that we, we did get some clarity that we were going to move forward with having to terminate our babies. But, but there was still this hope and this prayer that a miracle could happen. And, but, you know, by even in those last moments leading up to ultimately my procedure I just I had we had both really heard and felt strongly that they they would be restored in heaven their bodies would be restored and they would be out of their suffering and it was this was the most merciful thing we could do and so so that last appointment with that very with the the specialist I you know we knew where we were going to move forward, even though for me, it was, I mean, I had been so much anguish and agony over it all because I, I wanted my babies. I, we had planned for them. I, I wanted them and my, you know, I was already grieving the dreams I had dreamed of, you know, to have a family and to, to, to just for that short, very short window of time to, to learn that news that we were having twins like wow okay now we need two cribs and and oh my gosh we're going to need so much help and then that's very small window of time and to finding they were conjoined and thinking oh my gosh I don't even know how we're going to take care of you know conjoined twins and then to this you know the news just progressively got worse and worse and and just having to accept okay you know either either way I go if we decide to terminate this pregnancy or if we try to go through with it and lose them somehow 
through that process is it's heartbreaking either way. And so I'm, I'm just going through this extreme anguish and grief over my, my baby girls and, and just how much I, I already love them. I was only, you know, carried them to 16 weeks, three days, but the love that I had for both of them was just unimaginable. And I, I knew going into the procedure that it was going to be so insurmountable, the pain and the loss. So I was, I was fearful of what I would go through after. And so, so we went to one more, one more appointment and that was for the pre-op. And so we did our procedure, all, everything was at UCLA. We went to the pre-op and we got to see the babies one more time and get an ultrasound and get pictures printed. And my husband recorded the, the ultrasound, the, the monitor. And ultimately I had to take the, all the, all the, go through all the, the pre-op procedures of having to take, I think it was called the mifoprestin, mifo, yeah, me, I, I can't remember the name exactly, but I had to to take that. And I, I agonized and cried over that for 20 minutes or 20 minutes to half an hour in, in that room with my husband. I, I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, like, I just agonized over it and we, we prayed again and I took, I ultimately, I, I swallowed the pill and, and that was supposed to get me ready for, for the DNA procedure the next day. And then ultimately I, I had that the next day, early in the morning, we went to the hospital, went through the labor pains and all of that as, as if it were like, almost like a, a regular, you know, delivery and birth, but knowing that my baby girls would not come out alive and was rolled into the, the operating room and they, they, they were so kind to play some music, some calming music for me. I asked them to play this song called Psalm 23. And that was one of the, one of the songs I've been playing throughout this, this whole, that whole lap time leading up to it. And so they put me to sleep and then it was done. It was done very quickly. I woke up, it was like, it only took 25 minutes. And the very first question I asked out of my grogginess of coming out of, you know, my anesthesia was, did my babies feel any pain? And that was, I mean, I can barely remember it, but I remember that was the first question I asked. I don't know how it came out. It could have come out like, you know, very incoherent, but but the they 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 didn't know how to respond to me, I think. And so I didn't get a response and I was rolled out and back into the pre-op area where I was originally, where I remained for like an hour or two, maybe a little over an hour, and my family was able to come in and see me. And then I asked again, I asked the doc one of the doctors who had been part of the procedure and and she she said, well, there's there's so little that all of their nerves didn't all form yet, so they they didn't feel any pain. And and then they they also delivered their their handprints and their footprints. And my mom was with me at that time, so when they they delivered that to me, I opened it, opened the little cards up, and I, we looked at them. And my mom and I just broke out into tears and. And I, I just, again, was just crying and control, uncontrollably and, and just how tiny their handprints and their footprints in, were and just how cute and perfect they were. And just thinking of how much they grew in that time and developed like five perfect little or 10 perfect little fingers and 10 perfect little toes and, and just experiencing that heartbreak of I, did, I didn't get to see them. I didn't get to hold them. And, and I wouldn't be able to. So that was really difficult to me. My body was just in that shock. 
And, you know, throughout my pregnancy, I was so fearful of losing my babies. I was fearful of, you know, miscarriage and just possibly seeing any, any blood or, you know, that was a real big fear for me. So now I'm, I'm in the aftermath of this procedure and I'm bleeding and I'm just going through that recovery. My body's going through that change of not being pregnant anymore. I'm going through the postpartum depression and I'm going through just this incredible grief and, and also this trauma, those past, that past month. And then what grief would look like afterward, which it's been two months since the procedure and and it's like absolutely nothing I've ever been through before. I'm just at this point, I'm just trying to survive. It's been it's been really, really, really difficult for me. And my babies were were cremated after a few weeks after my procedure, my husband and I went on what was supposed to be our baby moon. And, and that was so difficult for me. The, the, we had, we were like, we didn't have a choice. We had to get our babies cremated just because of, there were pathological reasons why they had to be cremated. There wasn't any way to prepare their bodies for any kind of you know, burial or anything like that. So we have to get them cremated. And during that process too, that was during our, what was supposed to be our baby moon, we had to coordinate and call these different mortuaries that did offer that kind of service to cremate, basically to cremate, you know, fetuses. And, and so we had to go through that. And it was a special process where they had to draw up new contracts because they're conjoined. And so there's there was just all of this on top of the extreme heartbreak and, and heartache and, and sorrow. We still had to do all these, all these different things they had to get done. And so for me, I just, I was just like, when, when will, when will I have an opportunity just to just grieve without having to still take care of things and, tie up these last loose ends and, and just have an opportunity to just grieve for the, the sweet and beautiful and precious little girls that I very much wanted. And it was, it was just, I couldn't believe that we both, my husband and I had to go through that all. And it's just, sometimes I still wake up in the middle of the night. I, oftentimes I do with just reliving all of those traumatic experiences and and just thinking of my my baby girls and the last moments and and just ultimately you know losing them and just faced with these unbelievably difficult decisions it's it's just it's been i can't even believe sometimes still that this is this is my reality that this is real life and and all I want sometimes I just I just think all I want is for them to be back here with me and to be holding them and and life just didn't turn out that way and so you know there's so much more there's so much with the insurance the my insurance that wasn't willing to to pay cover any of the costs at first and just having to really advocate and finding another another option through my 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 work through my employer that would cover most the majority of of the the procedure but it was it it was quite <laughs> quite an, an unbelievable, unbelievably difficult journey that we both went on. And, and I'm still very much in that pit of grief. And so 
yeah, it's there's there's so much that I could still unpack just how it's affected my relationships, you know, my family and my my friends and now how it's it's hard to be around you know other families with little children and and other pregnant women and it's really difficult for me when we were on our trip i was just seeing you know all these little kids and babies and and that was it was heartbreaking for me because i'd always ask like why couldn't that have happened for for us and for my babies that they could live normal lives and so I'm still very much in that place of just extreme grief, extreme sorrow and trauma and just so many questions and really trying to just survive and trying to keep going, trying to press on and trying to honor the lives of, of my baby girls. I gave them names. Their names are Talia, Grace, and Kaya Mercy. And and just really special and significant in their meanings of their names for both of them. And yeah, and, and so I'm trying to honor their memories and their lives every day, every moment of my life. And I, I still I still talk to them and every time in the morning and before I go to sleep and when I come home, I'll go over to their urn and I'll give two little kisses um, and I'll just say, Hi, you know, my precious girls, I love you so much and I miss you and I'll, I'll still talk to them. And so, yeah, that's, that's been, you know, the bulk of my experience and definitely still trying to get through this. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm, I'm just so sorry that, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss and that you just had to, you know, that you had to go through all of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It sounds like you had pretty good support from your medical team. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I, I, I would definitely say that they were, I know that they cared very much and, and they're very, very highly specialized, like in their expertise to the highest level of knowing, you know, just in, in terms of the, the babies and their their condition and the heart and and all the other organs and just you know especially I would say with with the the last specialist that we saw at UCLA she was so kind and and so compassionate and even with the first specialist the fetal medicine specialist he he fought really hard. He said he fought tooth and nail with, with my, originally with my general insurance. And they, they all had to write letters, you know, to, to just explain how much I was at risk too. And so they, they really fought hard. And, and I know that they had all of our best interests in hand. So I'm thankful, you know, that we had, a lot of people who were very specialized and knowledgeable and could really help us throughout, you know, just to understand what was going on and to, to treat, to treat me as well. And, and the procedure went, did go really well. And my recovery was, was very smooth. So I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that. I think it's so frustrating though, that you had to you know, fight with your insurance over this. Like it shouldn't be, you know, it's like, it's not something that you want to have done. And then to have to fight with them over even covering it, you know, it's just, I think that's just ridiculous. Yeah. It, it was, it was unbelievable that, you know, for the, for the very, very unique case that this was and how threatening it was that they, they were, initially really unwilling to to cover anything to help at all it was just it just blew blew my mind and you did you live in California at the time you said yes so I live in California but my insurance was uh it was provided through another state which doesn't fully support um this this kind of 
procedure. And so that is, you know, the obstacle that we were running into with, with that provider. And so it was through letting my, my employer know, and then um, my HR, and they were able to get in contact with the benefits all the way up to the top. And they informed me of another, another thing provided, another service provided by my employer that does fully comply with California state law and was very willing to cover 70% of this procedure. And then, you know, by the time all of my statements or not statements, my medical bills came in, it was actually, they covered even more than what we thought they would cover and what they said they would cover. So, so that was such a blessing to, to know that I had another option and, and they were very willing and, and very understanding of my situation to, to help me with this all that this, this definitely, like you said, this was definitely, absolutely not what we wanted to do. And, but because of the circumstances, we, we had to go through with this and, and I'm, I'm thankful that there was another way that could advocate for us and could help us with that overwhelming, overwhelming costs of, of such a procedure. Well, and it sounds like you had, you know, a lot of supportive people in your life, like your family, your work. I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of supportive people. Were there, was there anybody that wasn't supportive or wasn't understanding of your situation? There were a few people and that was really, that was really hard. It is definitely one thing for people in our lives to not agree with our decision, but it was, it was a little more persistent in their, I guess, in their efforts to try to persuade us a different way. And, and so that was, that was difficult for me. I, I understand if there's people who don't agree, that's, that's okay. I, I know that there's always going to be people out there who don't agree, but there, there were people who who tried a few times to to get us not to do this and who expressed multiple times that they didn't agree and so that was tough but i i just kind of had to create some boundaries and really only let the people in my life who who were very supportive and very present and very loving and very understanding about our situation. I've kind of had to only really let them in my life for now and just to kind of step back a little bit from these other relationships. But overwhelmingly, the people that we have let into this, which hasn't been everybody. I mean, it's definitely a very delicate, sensitive situation. And so, but the people we have let into it have overwhelmingly been very loving, very, very supportive, very gracious to us. So yeah, that, that was, that was hard and it's still hard, but, but I'm working through that. And I, I want to be able to still have a relationship with these people and, and, and to be able to move forward. But for now, I, I definitely need my, (laughs) my space (laughs) and, um, And just to be around people who are safe for me right now. No, I think that makes complete sense. And, you know, I I just think it's so easy for people to say like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't support that until you're the one who's actually put in that position. You really don't know what you would do unless you are in that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I actually, I've had to communicate that a few times and you know, just to say, like, until you're in this, you you have no idea what this is like. And, and, you know, surprisingly, well, not, not very surprising. It is not surprising, but I, I guess at first I, I, I was a little surprised, but, but it's been, it's been kind of the, the parents and a little more like, you know, the, the parents, the more seasoned parents, the, the older 
parents, the, the parents with adult children that have been very, very supportive, very, just very understanding of, of our situation. They've been probably the, some of the most supportive people that we've come across. And, and so, you know, even though a lot of them haven't been through exactly what I've been through, they, they get it. And, and some of the parents that I've talked to, they've been through loss too, whether it's, you know, actually one, one older couple that I'm, I'm very close to, they, they've had to go through a TFMR too. And so I was, I was just so thankful that I could go to them and, and to, and to the wife who, who really, you know, like myself has really had to endure that the most, you know, just to, to know that I wasn't alone in that. And so that, that was a huge blessing, but yeah, just a lot of the older couples, parents that, that are in our lives have been the most understanding and the most loving through it all. Which I think is kind of amazing because usually you hear that those are the ones who are the least supportive just because they are, you know, quote from a, from a different time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that's amazing that, you know, that you found support in them. Yeah. That's, that's what I had thought too. I thought, oh, maybe their, their stances and their beliefs are different. And I was so afraid to share with anybody because I was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know who's going to, who's going to you know, what they're going to think and, and how my relationships are going to be, you know, changed, but yeah, just overwhelming support from them and, and other friends too, of all ages, but yeah, just, you know, surprised at the, the few that weren't and, but, but just thankful for, for those who were and just surprised that, you know, wow, that's, I mean, that's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm just so thankful for them. So before you had gone through it, did you know anybody else who had had to terminate for medical reasons? Yes. So it was the, the older couple that I had mentioned. They probably over, well, you know, it was over 30 years ago that they had to go through that too. And, and she had shared it before I was, you know, even pregnant, she, she shared it. And, and so during that time, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I, I can't even imagine what she, what they both had to go through. And, and I, you know, for me, I, I didn't, I had not even the wildest inkling that I would be having to go through that soon too. So it was really amazing that she felt really compelled to share that with me pretty much right before all of this culminated that taking that and knowing, you know, from the, from that prognosis, going to her and and saying, Oh, I'm, I'm now experiencing this too. You know, it's, it's, you know, really incredible that, that the timing of that happened just so, so close, you know, before, all of this happened with, with me. And so that was, you know, the only people that I knew that they've had to personally, that I know personally that they've, they, they've had to go through this too. And, and now that I've been going through this, there have been a few more people introduced to me who have had, have had to go through similar things. And I'm, I'm connecting a little more. There's another, uh, through, through other friends, they have relatives who've had to, had to go through a really complicated pregnancy. And so I'm going to connect with them too. I haven't connected yet. And so I'm, I'm kind of learning a little bit, trying to really make connections out there and just, you know, put a signal out there like, Hey, I'm here. And, and I would love to, to connect with, other parents and and moms who who've had to go through this unbelievably difficult thing too and feel as i felt like really alone have felt if 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 they've ever felt this kind of guilt and shame over it too that it's not this 
to, to feel that, oh, it's not the same kind of, it's not the same kind of pregnancy loss that other, other moms have gone through. Like, I'm here with you. I, I've gone through all those thoughts and all those emotions too, of feeling that, oh, you know, this is different, but really it's still a loss. It's still very much a loss. And, and we've all like, we wanted our babies. We, we love them so much and we, we never wanted to, to have to do this but I'm, I'm here and I'm putting my, my story, my, my testimony out there. So, and I, I'm hoping that I can find other women who've had to go through this too. And, and we can all be there for each other. I think it's amazing that you're willing to, you know, share your story, especially with it being so recent. And I know you're still, I mean, not that the grief ever like goes away, but I know like, you know, those first weeks and months are, first year is just incredibly hard. So, I mean, just thank you so much for, you know, sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you for having, you know, this, this podcast. Thank you for having this place, this, this outlet for, you know, for, for me and for other, other moms out there who have, who have lost their little ones. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to share, Ad? Just, I think just hang in there. It's, it's not, it is definitely, there's nothing easy about this, any kind of loss, but know that you're not alone. And for myself, I know I'm not alone. And, you know, just to take comfort in knowing that the grief and, and the sadness that you're experiencing is the love that you had for, for your babies. And, and just know that that grief that you're feeling is, is that love that's still, it's still very much going to your, your precious little one. And, and so, and our little ones are all together and, you know, they're, we're, we're all together in this and I'm with, I'm with, I'm with you all, like all mamas out there who have, have lost, you know, I'm, I'm with you. You know, it's a club that none of us ever wanted to be in, but there's a lot of really, really great people in it. Yes, definitely. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and, and sharing your story with us. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. I'm, I'm really glad I got to, to share that with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany, for sharing your story with us. Every time I hear another lost story, they still just make me so sad. Even though I haven't been through the exact experience as the other stories I hear, there are common things that we can all relate to. We all know what it's like to lose our baby. We all know what it's like to grieve not only them, but the things that could have been. We know how hard the due dates and anniversaries are. We don't have to have the exact same experience to know just how heartbreaking it is for everyone who goes through it regardless of when the loss happened. I think this is why it's important to find others who have been through it. They just get it so much more than anyone else ever will. They understand how you feel, and they don't judge you for it. The lost community truly is the worst club with the best members. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.